from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. I'm Tyne Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. Record river levels in California. Communities are hurting. Farms are hurting. As farmers in one heavy ag production area brace for the worst. Are cover crops the new cash crop? I think that this week's announcement uh, with, uh, with uh, Corteva really shows that Chevron and, and Bungie are, are in it to win it. Why Big Oil is joining forces with Big Ag to fuel renewable diesel. A Texas teen's tractor restoration journey to take home the grand prize. And in Sean's world. Coping with the duck curve. Now for the news, we begin with a developing story in what's been a jittery week for some banks, with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank suddenly collapsing. The Biden administration and federal officials working to stem the fallout. Silicon Valley Bank, where SVB saw a sudden run on funds and then a capital crisis leading to the lender being taken over by federal regulators. The Treasury Department, FDIC and Federal Reserve have since decided to backstop deposits, working to stem wider financial and economic fallout. SVB has backed some 1,500 startups and companies in the technology and sustainability sectors, including ag company Farmers Business Network, Impossible Foods, indoor produce grower Bowery Farming, and Phylogen, which is a data and microbial genomics firm. Thanks to the quick action of my administration over the past few days, Americans can have confidence that the banking system is safe. Your deposits will be there when you need them. Small businesses across the country, the deposit accounts at these banks can breathe easier knowing they'll be able to pay their workers and pay their bills. And their hardworking employees can breathe easier as well. He's basically saying, look, I can't take this risk anymore. I'm just going to nationalize the whole thing. And that's the way we should look at banking going forward. Nothing more than highly regulated utilities. And that has profound impacts for you as an investor. If you thought putting your money into bank stocks was a good idea, you should change your mind this morning forever. And should you own bank bonds? Never. You were taught that lesson over the weekend. If you Worries about a spreading of banking crisis and how badly it would hit the economy sent shutters through markets with stocks and bond yields tumbling on both sides of the Atlantic this week. A new partnership is being formed to meet the growing demand for lower carbon renewable fuels. Corteva, Bungie and Chevron teaming up to introduce winter canola hybrids that will produce plant based oil with a lower carbon profile. The companies say the goal is to increase the availability of vegetable oil feedstocks primarily for renewable fuels. The companies report they plan to introduce the canola in the southern U.S. with the goal of creating a new revenue opportunity for farmers with a sustainable crop rotation. Another story we're continuing to follow this weekend, too much rain and snow in California. Crews working on emergency repairs to the Pajaro River levee in Monterey County, a key ag area. The levee was damaged due to the atmospheric river that caused a breach. Heavy rain triggering evacuation orders in the area and concerns about landslides. Rivers rising, especially in the Central Valley of California. Later this week, we are expecting some record high river levels. One gauge that is expecting a record crest is along the San Joaquin River at Patterson, which is a heavily agricultural community along the river. The persistent heavy rain and the melting snow are expected to flood regions still recovering from recent deadly storms. We know in January that 20,000 or so flooded. We don't have an accurate um, uh, take on this March's event and impact. The bad news is, you know, there's more acreage, there's going to be more direct crop loss, there's gonna be more negative impact onto the agricultural economy, families and farm workers that will continue kind of suffering through this region. Meanwhile, on the East Coast, the first nor'easter of the season brought heavy snow and high winds to the Northeast and New England. Several cows were killed when a barn collapsed at a dairy farm in Massachusetts. The owners of Shaw Farm saying they, quote, experienced one of life's unexpected challenges, adding no staff members were hurt. 
Tyson says it's shutting down two chicken plants. The plants located in Glen Allen, Virginia and Van Buren, Arkansas. Combined, they have almost 1,700 employees. Last month, the company missed Wall Street estimates for its quarterly profit. Tyson had predicted a strong demand for chicken at supermarkets last November and December, and that chicken would fill a gap caused by reduced beef and pork production, but meat supplies turned out to be larger than expected. Well, it appears the rapid rise in farmland values may be starting to slow. The Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City is saying it's due right now to higher interest rates. Economists say while the value of most types of farmland continues to rise, the increase is the slowest since early 2021. They say ag credit conditions remain strong in the fourth quarter and continue to be bolstered throughout last year. It says the outlook for credit conditions this year remains generally positive, but there are concerns about operating expenses, those higher interest rates, as well as drought persisting. That's it for the news. Well, drought has pretty much disappeared in the central part of California, but it's coming at a cost. Flooding this week. We'll see when this weather pattern could finally shift with a check of your forecast next. U.S. Farm Report is sponsored by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator Steel Closing Wheels, perfected in conventional, excels in no-till. Order 12 to 16 rows today and qualify for free shipping or 20% off an end zone moisture management package. U.S. Farm Report weather is brought to you by H&S Manufacturing. Experience the highest quality windrow in the industry with our new 32-foot twin flex merger. It can merge seven 10-foot windrows into one and features the largest hydraulic system capacity on the market in the 32-foot model class. Find out more at the h &S website. Time now for a check of weather. Andrew Whitmire joining us this weekend. Andrew, another atmospheric river drenching California, causing that historic flooding this week. But the Northeast is buried in snow. How much longer is this very active weather pattern going to be with us, Andrew? Well, Tyne, it's really all thanks to the stratospheric warming that we've been seeing. That's helped to funnel in these colder air temperatures down across the lower 48. And we've also seen the disappearance here of La Nina going to more of a neutral state for the Pacific Ocean water temperatures. And that's again kind of just allowing us to be stuck in kind of this uh, late wintry pattern here. Notice the blues here on this week's root zone. That's an indication of where the soils are pretty moist and where we've had that atmospheric river over the past several months here. Uh, we're going to continue to see more waves of active weather across the California coastline as well as parts of the deep south uh, dealing with more inundated uh, water chances here as we head on into this upcoming week. Let's take a look at our drought monitor. Notice how much of California over the course of the past three months has really seen much of the at least the worst drought conditions really kind of uh, gone and erased. Uh, meanwhile, we continue to watch far western Kansas here where we really need the moisture and we need the moisture fast before we start really ramping up growing season here over the course of the next one to two months and down into Texas. The western half of Texas, we're really starting to dry out as well, and we really could use waves of moisture. But unfortunately, it looks like our chances are just going to have to wait. Here's a look at our precipitation for this week. Notice how we get those below average of precipitation values across the southern plains and likely even extending into parts of uh, Kansas as well. Meanwhile, where the atmospheric river will still continue to pump in moisture. That's where the above average of precipitation will likely occur here for this upcoming week. And as we take a look at the jet stream here, we're going to see it dipping down a nice little trough trying to develop down across the western coast. That'll likely allow for some cooler temperatures for this upcoming week. Meanwhile, a nice subtle ridge will bring back some early spring like temperatures to parts of the Midwest Great Lake states and even parts of the New England coastline. Let's check out your weather here for this Monday. We're going to be watching lots of high pressure for March 20th uh, down across the deep south. Meanwhile, active weather staying across the Pacific Northwest. And then as we head on into Wednesday, we're going to be watching this nice Colorado low developing here. Hopefully again, we can squeeze out some moisture chances for the central plains where we really do need those waves of uh, precipitation to move on through. And then as we round out this upcoming week for Friday, March 24th, that low begins to work its way eastward, bringing with it pockets of heavy rain potentially for parts of the deep south as well as parts of the Great Lakes. Well, China coming in with some big buys of corn this week, 
plus the fallout from the SVB situation. We'll cover it all with Dwayne Bussey and Trey Cronin right after the break. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. This weekend, Dwayne Bussey and Treg Cronin joining us. All right, Treg, the big news this week, China. China coming to the market to buy corn. Do we know why China is now coming to the market, especially for corn, and how much have they purchased so far? Well, that's the, to, to the last question, that's a great question uh, because every day we've had a big sales announcement and, and a lot of experts still think there's more to come. But um, not really a big surprise in terms of why they're buying. Um, they took advantage of a big price drop. We dropped 50 cents um, a bushel on corn in the five days ended the, uh, the last five days of February. And they stepped in, started buying then. They've continued to buy uh, as corn's kind of snuck lower. And again, when you look at China's balance sheet, it was you know pretty apparent that they were going to have to buy corn from someone. It's just that most people thought it was going to be Brazil. And China's a very opportunistic buyer, so they're stepping in, buying some U.S. corn, and and I think that that's helped stem the tide uh, the last several days. So uh, we'll take it, and and uh, hopefully there's more to come. Well, and further proof. I mean, it's it's not like our relationship with China has improved or, or changed. So just further proof that they will buy on price and they will buy when they need it, uh, no matter what geopolitical issues are, are going on. But when we look at corn exports, Dwayne, that has been a concern. I mean, we've been talking about that. So these purchases, is it right on time? Is it, is it too late? What are your thoughts? It, it might be just a little bit too late for the markets when you think about it. The bears are always going to push on these USA flash sales days to China. There's, the bears are still going to suggest, you know, we're too far behind and it's hard to catch up. And, and they're not wrong saying that. Uh, it would take a lot of these sales to get caught up to actually have USA stop lowering our export demand and actually start to increase it. So, yeah, it, it's maybe a little too late, but at least it should stop USDA from decreasing our export demand moving forward is my hope. Well, another big story this week, SVB. And, and when you look at last weekend, a lot of uncertainty, whether some of these companies, including some of these agricultural start, startup companies, whether they would even be able to make payroll. But then we saw the Fed announcement. And so those those concerns eased. But still, we are seeing fallout specifically, Treg, what is going on with this oil market? And then how is that having a ripple effect here, here on ag commodities? One thing the markets do not like is uncertainty and volatility. And so whether or not uh, what's going on in the, the, the banking sector has anything directly attributable to AGS, uh, when you get in these type of environments, it's kind of sell anything that's not nailed down. And I think that that's why we've seen the relative performance of our markets um, going into this, this kind of event. We had funds long corn and soybeans. We saw those um, commodities really come under pressure, but we saw wheat, you know, kind of rally on a relative basis. Well, funds were short a pile of wheat, so it it definitely had that feel of of, of funds get, exiting positions. Now the question becomes, can we kind of stand on our own moving forward here on on our own fundamentals? Get back to watching cash markets. Get back to watching spreads. Keep some risk premium in for spring planting, the growing season. Or are we going to continue to get swept up in this kind of, uh, you know, uh, asset wide volatility? And and as we as everybody is looking back to 2008 as the as the last you know kind of roadmap for something like this, uh, our markets did not fare well, and it had nothing to do with grains specifically. So that's the fear. Hopefully, the Fed has has stepped in at, at uh, the right time and, and kind of stemmed the the outflows, but that's that's going to be a concern, I think, as, as we continue to see these headlines come across. Well, and, and Dwayne, cattle being tied so closely to the economy, anytime there's nervousness or even talk of a recession like we're talking about now, typically there's a close tie there. Did we have some of that fallout then impact cattle prices this week? Oh, I think they did for sure. I think Treg is nailing it. You know, I think this past week, our market action was more about the liquidating positions because they had margin calls and something else, I, I, you know, money flow situation that hit the cattle market about the middle part of this week. But towards the end of the week, we kind of started to rally back on the fundamental news that supplies were just super tight and uh, cash market, I think, inching higher as we go into the weekend here. All right. Well, a lot of talk about about acreage. Both of you are up in that, that South Dakota area where you are getting a lot of moisture, including this past week. So we need to talk about, you know, what is the reality of prevent plant? Look at these acreage mixes as we saw some acreage forecasts come out this week. And, and ultimately, how is that impacting the market as we head into USDA's prospective planting reports? So we need to take a quick break, but, but we will cover all of that later coming up on U.S. Farm Report. 
U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Brandt, technology-driven nutrition that feeds your crop. The hot spot for solar power? John Phipps explains in John's World this week. The rapid growth of solar power has not been evenly distributed across the U.S. Since states have considerable control of utility policies and rates, the differences between renewable and fossil fuel generated electricity is dramatic, even in adjacent states. At one end of the spectrum of this transition is California, which I continue to believe will drag the rest of the country toward lower emissions. It will also serve as a pilot plant, discovering by trial and error how to scale up renewable energy. It will undoubtedly be a bleeding edge, as the saying goes. For example, here's the infamous California duck curve for electricity demand and solar power supply. Year by year, both more efficient electrical use and more installed solar makes the curve lower, but the waves more pronounced. And there's a quick note here. Check the scale to the left. The bottom is not zero, but 16 gigawatts, so that the spread from peak demand to minimum was about six, or seven uh, gigawatts in 2022, which is roughly 30%. Even as more renewable power is added, the, the problem of smoothing out net demand remains. The duck is flattening a little, but still causing grid problems. Oddly, EVs may help there, especially if recharging is timed for the middle of the night. During high demand, EVs could actually contribute to household supply. The obvious hope is large amounts of battery storage to feed demand in mornings and evenings from supplies stored uh, uh, during the rest of the day. Large battery installation by utilities are already in progress. The duck curve is echoed across the nation, but California gives us an extreme example to learn from. The most efficient electrical storage is those large commercial batteries, but it's becoming clear that solutions requiring better grids for transferring power will face formidable opposition. Between extravagant interpretations of EPA regulations, especially the endangered species protection, and the ability of a handful of local officials with permitting authority, America is a place where big things don't get done, especially across state lines. Overriding such NIMBYs, which include too many farmers and environmental extremists, won't happen in my lifetime. That said, never underestimate the ingenuity of Americans to improvise workarounds. Next week, I'll detail some of the ways individual households can flatten their own ducks. Well, when we come back, we're off to North Carolina to check out a cub. Tractor Tales is next. The 2023 Bracket Busters Challenge, presented by Case IH, is underway. Who's still in the game? To find out, head to AgWeb now through April 3rd to check the leaderboard. Got equipment to sell privately but tired of scams and hassles? Visit MachineRepeat.com and click Sell Mine. MachineRepeat.com, the simple and secure way to buy and sell equipment online. Hey, welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. This week we're off to North Carolina to check out a white Farmall Cub Demonstrator. We've got a 50 Farmall Cub Demonstrator. And they made these from uh, January 1950 to March 1950. And they made about 6,700 of them. And when they came to the dealer, they supposed to demonstrate, show what they would do. When they sold them, they were supposed to be painted back red. And this is one with the original number, so it is a demonstrator. This one has had a total motor rebuild. It's been rebored, the shaft turned, everything redone in it. The clutch, pressure plates, all been redone. It's pretty much uh, been gone through all together. When I first joined the club, I wanted a small tractor because I had a small truck and trailer, and the cub was the small tractor. And I've used farm all all my life. So I'm familiar with international products. We're down in tobacco country and they use these tobacco farming. Everybody had either a Sloop A or a Cub, one or the other, that was the tractor. It's different, it's different. you don't see many of them. I think they made 6,700 out of 250,000. I have put a uh, remote hydraulic system on it 
and we uh, we turned hydraulic ice cream freezer with for the shows and whatever. This is just strictly a show tractor. I just carry it to the shows, and that's all it does. It stays in the barn the rest of the time. And don't forget to check out more Tractor Tales on our Tractor Tales Facebook page. Right up next, you've heard the case for planting cover crops for conservation. But what if you could harvest it and turn your cover crop into a cash crop? Our Farm Journal Report explains how you can do exactly that next. Closed captioning on U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by BASF. BASF, helping you to do the biggest job on Earth. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. Well, you can find the cover crop Pennycress on about 10,000 acres this winter. The seed was developed by Covercress, an ag tech startup with the backing of Bayer, Bungie, and Chevron. Big ag joining forces with big oil is actually gaining traction. And with another announcement just this week, it's clear cover crops could be the new cash crop to fuel the crush for renewable diesel. Renewable diesel is revving up interest for both agriculture and the oil industry. There seems to be no, no holding back this investment in renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel. I'll put it that way. A growing industry that's painting optimism within agriculture is also one that saw a potential setback in December. We were extremely disappointed in the uh, renewable volume obligations that have been announced for biodiesel, renewable diesel, uh, for 23 through 25. It basically uh, flatlines our industry over the next several years. It doesn't take into account the significant growth that's happening in the soybean crush sector. EPA's proposed rule also prompted Dan Bossy of Ag Resource to pare back his forecast for how many additional acres the U.S. would need to meet the renewable diesel demand. The RVO came down from, uh, from EPA back in December, late November, December, and so that adjusted our acreage a little bit. We now think it's somewhere between 14 or 15 million acres additional that we need by 2026 looking forward in terms of soy Soybean acres. Peter Meyer of S&P Global Commodity Insights has also been watching the growth potential closely. We had a conversation with a major, major oil company this week and they said to, they, they asked me why my soybean oil demand for renewable diesel is flat from 24 to 25 and I said because you run out of crop and you run out of crush capacity. S&P Global Commodity Insights forecast crush capacity in the U.S. to grow by 25% in just a couple years. And the first major U.S. plant to produce renewable diesel is set to come online yet this month. There's an enormous plant out in Martinez, uh, California, yeah. which is um, a marathon plant that is, is going to be running in the first quarter and then running full bore by, by the fourth quarter. Meyer says that's the plant everyone is watching. See, that's a joint venture between Marathon and Nestea. We're, we're tracking used cooking oil imports into the U.S. very closely. They have increased quite a bit. That would be the preferred feedstock for that plant. Whether or not they have enough, that's the question. As more crush facilities come online, the California plant will produce renewable diesel from mainly used cooking oil for now. China is the world's largest exporter of used cooking oil. And uh, there, United States used cooking oil was was basically exported into Singapore, converted into renewable diesel and brought back into California. Now with the Martinez, California plant coming online, we think the used cooking oil stays in the U.S. and also the U.S. becomes a net importer. Soybeans will still be the main source for other renewable diesel plants coming online, but with not enough soybean acres to meet that demand, companies are also looking at other crops. Camelina certainly is going to be a source and, and now uh, winter rapeseed or winter canola, if you if you prefer, uh, is going to be a source. Just this week, Corteva, Bungie and Chevron announced a commercial collaboration to introduce a proprietary winter canola hybrid that would produce plant based oil with a lower carbon profile. The goal, increase availability of vegetable oil to fuel the domestic renewable fuels market. I think that this week's announcement with uh, Corteva really shows that Chevron and, and Bungie are, are in it to win it. And it also shows that they have a lot of concern that despite the fact that we're going to have additional soy oil or soybean crush capacity coming online here in two years, 
and they don't want to rely on that. Corteva's announcement comes on the heels of a joint venture between Shell Oil and SNW Seeds to grow Camelina. It's called Vision Biofuels, and uh, it's uh, owned by both Shell and SNW Seeds. So we formed a separate joint venture. Uh, they're going to be doing uh, breeding and research, and actually at one of our former facilities in Nampa, Idaho. Brent Johnson of SNW Seeds telling U.S. Farm Report the goal is to give growers another possible seed source that doesn't take away from their crop rotation today. I think a key point to the Camelina is we're not, it's not going to replace any of our uh, food production acres, right? Uh, it's an, it's an additives. While the main idea is to use it as a cover crop, it could also be planted as a double crop in early spring. It's a very short season crop, 90 days to harvest. The Corteva canola announcement this week is also geared toward a cover crop option for farmers, but one from which they can harvest and profit as well. So this way they can grow it, they can grow it in the, in the winter, harvest it in the spring, then run it into the run it into those crush plants in Destrehan, Louisiana, and Cairo, Illinois, the bungy crush plants there, and then and then let it go and then wait for the next crop to come. Meyer says the true test to all of these investments could come later this year. 2023 is going to be the year where we find out who the contenders are and who the pretenders are. As more joint ventures are announced, it's opening the door for a new era of opportunity. Who would have ever thought, time that oil companies would have been in the seed business? This is big oil joins big ag. A new partnership that's also planting new opportunities for farmers. We believe that this presents a tremendous opportunity to them for a second cash crop. Meyer says it's not just one crop, but a multitude of crops that farmers could cash in on in the years ahead. They planted 10,000 acres of, of, of Pennycrest this year. They're looking for 20 million acres. 20 million is their, is their target within the next five years. That's why Meyer encourages all farmers to keep an open mind to those opportunities that could arise in the months and even years ahead. This is the opportunity, not necessarily for you to have to change your, change your rotation or whatever, but the fact of the matter is this is an opportunity for you to make more money on your land if you pay attention to what's going on around you. Now, Meyer did caution that the SBB situation and the fears of a banking crisis may slow down some of the smaller investments into agriculture, including the renewable diesel space. But as far as the big players go, like Shell and Chevron, he says it doesn't matter. Those players are in it to win it. All right, when we come back with all this snow in the north, is it too early to talk about Prevent Plant? Our marketing roundtables are next. Welcome back to our marketing roundtables this weekend. Treg and Dwayne rejoining us. All right, both of you are up in that South Dakota area, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, seeing just so much snow right now. There is starting to be some talk about possibly prevent plant, but Treg, is, is it too early to start talking about that yet? I think it is sitting here today. Um, if we're in these same conditions three weeks from now, I don't think it's going to be a stretch. And and we will have some prevent plant this year. Uh, I mean, that's that's almost a certainty um, with the with the pockety regions, especially up in Duane's country. Um, but the other thing to remember is a lot of our area ended the year um, fairly empty on soil moisture, and so a lot of what we've seen this winter has gone in the ground. Uh, I think we're going to see a nice recharge of of soil profiles. So um, as the, the, the farmer in me, I'm more concerned about getting the moisture back than I am getting in the field, you know, the middle of March. But it's going to it's going to play a role if these forecasts don't change again, if we're into the middle of April and we're still looking at below normal temperatures and snow to melt, um, then it's really going to ramp up. And and with acres so tight for everything from specialties to corn to soybeans to wheat, everybody needs acres this year. And so. If, if that does play out that way the next, you know, three, four weeks here, uh, you're going to start to see markets get a little bit jumpy, I think. Well, Dwayne, that leads into my next question, because if we do start to see some prevent plant pop up, you know, what acres could that potentially take away from? We were already talking about a, a reduction in spring wheat acres in that area. Yeah, a reduction in spring wheat acres at a time we really can't lose spring wheat acres. And honestly, I usually ask Treg when it comes to a lot of the spring wheat market questions, but I think he'll back me up saying that our, our stocks are unbelievably tight. We're down to 15-year lows for supplies in spring wheat and in total wheat, and and we need those acres. And with the yeah snowpack up here, you know, possibly colder start to the spring, that really puts in question the spring wheat acres. And 
a, you know, market job might be to make sure that those acres get planted. And usually that means higher prices, but to Drake's point, we are a little early to talk about it. Normally planning delays, we don't see a rally until, you know, about the May timeframe when, when, you know, the, the progress reports come out and they show that we're already behind. So Trey, considering market conditions, considering that, you know, the weather patterns right now, what are you looking at as far as acreage goes, you know, increase in a reduction, talking about those core crops, including wheat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to look at, at price ratios, economics right now and not think that uh, we're going to lose some spring wheat acres, especially when you combine it with the forecast. So it's very difficult to to hold spring wheat acreage unchanged from last year, even though, as Duane alluded to, it, it cannot afford to lose any acres. So, but but based on everything we're looking at right now, you have to be unchanged to maybe down a touch. Um, on the other hand, it looks, I mean, every reason, you both anecdotally, economically, it seems like corn acres are going to be up. Uh, guys are excited about planting corn. Um, bean acres should be up. Uh, I think those two are going to dominate and, and try and um, pull acres away from specialties, from uh, wheat, uh, anywhere they can. So um, that said, uh, we've seen the last several years, it's just really difficult to get over that 180 million combined mark. And you can split it up any way you want, but we've just had a very difficult time getting over that, that level. And whether you want to blame it on uh, dollar generals or solar panels, um, that that's uh, a discussion for another time. But uh, it's I think people should be cautious about assuming that um, because we've got six dollar corn, um, we can just pick our number on corn. So then, Dwayne, if we do see a spring weather rally out of the commodities, which one do you think then is meant to be sold? Uh, corn in probably, uh, I'm going to just say the corn market, because uh, really when you think about it over last year, we've rationed demand in corn. So when we get a rally in corn, and I think we will on a spring weather scare, I think that one has to be sold the hardest. But, you know, back to Trey's point, you know, last year we, we rallied to 750 in May and couldn't buy this many corn acres as we're projecting right now. All right, Treg, Dwayne, thank you so much. Stay warm up there. But we appreciate you joining us this weekend. All right, we need to take a quick break and then we'll have much more right here on U.S. Farm Report. Well, when you think of Stuttgart, Arkansas, you may think of duck hunting, but one farm family is leaving their own mark, focusing on that area's most precious resource, water. And it's their focus on water conservation that landed them a spot as American Soybean Association's Regional Conservation Legacy Award winner. Whether it's for growing crops or habitat for ducks, water is a vital part of life in Stuttgart, Arkansas. It's the lifeblood of this farm. Low-lying farm country tucked into the southeastern corner of the state. The Dabbs family has been managing that vital resource for generations. And we grow soybeans, rice, corn. We uh, operate about 3,500 acres, some owned, some leased. We're in a critical groundwater area, so conservation efforts and water quantity has always been a big concern. To help, the family added storage via reservoirs as a way to capture water and save it for use during the growing season. The alluvial aquifer on this farm disappeared in the mid-70s, so the reservoirs became our prime source of irrigation in that time frame. But even that wasn't enough. So in the 1950s and 60s, their parents and grandparents began the process of making the farm more water efficient. They enclosed all of the open air canals opting to run piping from field to field. Where we can pump in and out of our reservoirs, our tailwater ditches, and co collect all the water that comes off of our farm to put it back in our system to reuse again. We don't want to be, you know, putting any more fertilizers or, or water on these fields than, than are necessary. You know, we're not out here trying to just flood, 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 and do things like that. We want to conserve uh, resources as much as anybody. They're also implementing minimum tillage cover crops and measuring runoff. To test the water leaving our farm for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. And we have found out that there is very, very little of any of those leaving our farm. It's all part of the plan to leave this farm and this land for the next generation. 
We feel that, that farmers are the ultimate conservationists. Without conservation, we can't continue what we do. We've got to be able to maximize the yields and the, and the ability to make a profit on this farm. We're not doing those things just to win an award. We're doing those things uh, because we're rooted deep in this community. Which is why, after all of these years, they're still focused on continuous improvement. I hope we can use this and let other people see what maybe we're doing and, and maybe even people will contact us and say, hey, maybe here's something you need to try. Congratulations to the Dabbs family, a regional winner for the American Soybean Association's Conservation Legacy Award. Well, we did introduce you to the overall ASA Conservation Legacy Award winner last weekend at Commodity Classic, and all those stories can be found on agweb.com. Well, when we come back from a chip shortage to a glut of chips, customer support is next. Well, no matter how tired you probably are of hearing about supply chain issues and chip shortages, for equipment manufacturers, it's still a hurdle today. But could another problem be on the horizon? That's customer support this week. A question today about the semiconductor chip shortage. There's much attention being given to the integrated chip plants being built in the U.S. Obviously good for security reasons, but no one seems to be talking about the business implications for the companies building them and the manufacturing overcapacity that will inevitably result for the industry. It is not inconceivable that they will eventually require government subsidies or expensive exclusive government contracts for the same security reasons. We can only hope that the new facilities will be the most efficient, keeping their manufacturing costs at the lowest possible, at least for now. And that's my viewer in Ohio who requested anonymity. I guess the good news is we don't have to worry about a chip glut in the future because it's here right now. Now, that, now that's for basic memory chips, not the cutting edge two nanometer stuff. The business collapse of the pandemic and the supply, stuttering supply chain recovery didn't make industry giants like Taiwan Semiconductor and Samsung, who make the majority of all chips, halt all production. Phones, watches, and computers use about 50% of all semiconductors, and the rest are much smaller volumes of more specialized, non-interchangeable devices that will be a lower priority to produce. The twist is just as we're throwing billions at building chip foundries and factories here, the prices have made any chances of profit for those plants a distant dream. Nor are those two industry giants idly standing by while customers like us decide to do it ourselves. With their head starts in research and experience, it will take decades for any new facilities to catch up in sophistication and volume. The enormous CHIPS Act passed by Congress last year prompted a flurry of planned construction announcements, which are now running into predicted problems. Labor and construction costs, siting controversies, local opposition, and now low product prices. The huge TSMC foundry plan for Arizona example is estimated now to cost five times what it would cost if built back in Taiwan. Will we have gluts or shortages of chips? Looks like we could end up with both as we try to force the market to solve what are essentially political problems. Thanks, John. Well, up next, a Texas teen with a very special tractor restoration that ended up being a down payment for his future. We have that story in From the Farm next. Well, each week during Tractor Tales, we share stories of tractor restoration projects, but also the meaning behind the classic iron. And for one Texas teen, his tractor restoration journey earned him a grand prize during the annual San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo. Patricia Perry from KCBD shares his story. This isn't Kate Clark's first time on a tractor, and it certainly won't be his last. This time, though, it's extra sweet because this 1954 tractor won him some big bucks. That's going to pay for my college. Clark won first place in his class, grand champion in his division, 
and reserve grand champion of all the tractors in San Antonio. I won two welders, two torches, toolbox, two buckles, and then a $10,000 scholarship. He didn't do it for the fame, the glory, or even the new welders. He did it for the smiles he knew he'd get when everyone saw this shiny new tractor. The people I bought it from, they were crying whenever it left on the trailer, so I really I wanted to make it nice for them. And then their son was helping me, and I knew he was really, he really wanted to see it new. So It took 700 hours of work to take it from this to farm ready. It was it's like a sense of accomplishment. He's been in FFA for four years and says he's learned a lot. It's taught me responsibility, a lot of self-discipline. Which will help him in his next steps. After he walks across the stage, he's plowing into his degree in ag business and a future of farming. But first, he has another stock show to focus on in Houston. I'm pretty confident there's a couple of things I've got to do to it that the judge just told me at San Antonio. Once I get those fixed, I feel like I'll do pretty well. Patricia Perry, KCBD News Channel 11. What a sweet gesture and a very deserving prize for such a special kid. Thanks for sharing that story, Patricia. And on that note, that does it for U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Thank you for watching. Be sure to tune in next weekend as we're off to Ontario, Canada for the annual March Classic as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.